so this weekend I also was at Doc Opera and in it, and it, everyone said the show was really successful this year and really fun, and I'm glad it's over with. I have like a lot more free time now, so, um, and I'm kind of sad that it will be my last Doc Opera. Aww. Next year I'll get to watch. It'll be good. Yeah, Okay, group, um, thanks for the check-in, and uh, let's get started with the case. Okay, sure. yeah, so, so we have, a, we have a, a big case and, and not a whole lot of time, so uh, maybe we should uh, just go ahead and get started. Uh, Kevin, you're, you're scribing today, yeah. right? And uh, Cece, you're, you're mm -hmm. timekeeper? Yeah. Okay, um, good. So who wants, to, who wants to start with like maybe a discussion on just normal sugar processing? Um, I can do it. So you have oh. your beta cell in the pancreas. And it'll sense glucose in the blood. So here's glucose being sensed. And this will stimulate the release of insulin. So you have your vesicles, and here's insulin being released into the blood. And glucose comes in through passive diffusion. I think it's also important to add to the diagram that um, glucose comes into the cell via the GLUT2 transporter. Right. So yeah, right. Okay, so. We have our GLU2 receptor, and when glucose comes in, it increases ATP within the cell, and then this is the signal for insulin to be released. So I just want to add some more about the biochemical aspects of it. So what we have in the cell is an increase in ATP, which causes these potassium channels to close up. And once the potassium channels close, um, this causes depolarization to open the calcium channels. So the calcium increases inside the cell, and then calcium will bind to the vesicles that contain insulin to help them exocytose and get released. All right, um, so what happens now that uh, insulin's been released into the bloodstream? Okay. So uh, I guess I'll go up. So insulin. Um, Coming off of Steph's diagram over here, insulin is going to bind some cells in your body, um, and there is receptors on these cells for the insulin. Um, and then what's going to happen is once the insulin binds, that there are vesicles inside these cells that have GLUT4 receptors, and those GLUT4 receptors um, vesicles are going to come to the cell surface so that the GLUT4 can be expressed and then glucose combined. Just as an aside, um, before as we're talking about insulin being in the blood, um, the like 50% of the blood from the pancreas goes through the portal vein before, so like 50% of insulin is actually released um, before it um, goes to the cystic cells. You got? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool, thanks Keisha. Mm -hmm. And once glucose is, uh, makes it into the cell, it goes through a lot of different uh, uh, like processing pathways, but I think that's a little outside of the scope of the case. Don't you guys agree? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so maybe we'll, we'll just skip those, but does any, th anybody have anything to add to just the normal processing of sugar? Oh, I'd just really quickly like to add that the downstream signaling of insulin is through the MAP kinase pathway. Um, also, in addition to facilitating glucose transport into the cell, insulin signals through mitogenic pathways, which keep the cells alive and regenerating. Okay, group, so I think the biochemistry is really important in this case, but I also think that there are a lot of other aspects that you haven't covered yet, and I think you really should start to focus on these aspects. Agree? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 So, so maybe just to summarize a little bit what we, what we talked about. Um, so we have that glucose goes into, uh, into the cell through the GLUT2 channel, um, where once it gets inside, it, it's processed to make ATP. Uh, when the ATP goes up, it, it closes potassium channels, which depolarizes the cell and increases and causes calcium to influx into the cell. And that'll release insulin. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. And then that insulin binds other cells in your body, um, which causes the GLUT4 receptors to be expressed and, and allow glucose to enter those cells. Okay. All right. Uh, now that we've covered that, does anybody want to start with a workup on diabetes? Um, well, I guess I can I guess start about um, epidemiology. So I know there are certain risk factors that are kind of involved with diabetes. 
um, such as like being overweight, like obesity. Um, I know there's some things like lack of exercise. So if you have like a sedentary lifestyle or if you sit at a computer all day where you work. Um, and then just like uh, a poor diet. So if you're not eating the right amount of fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing. Um, and I think there's a genetic component. Um, I think um, type 1 has a higher genetic concordance than type 2, but I wasn't sure. I, I actually think I read it up to date that type 2 is the one that type has two. the higher genetic concordance over okay. type 1. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. You think like type 1 is kind of like the inherited juvenile kind of thing, but um, I guess that's kind of the research that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Did anyone else see that? Yeah, that, yeah I found the same thing as, as Kevin. Maybe we, maybe we should look into it uh, a little more. Maybe we can talk about it on Friday. Okay. okay. Right. Sounds good. Okay. Um, let's move on to the path. Um, so in type 1 diabetes, the beta cells get destroyed in the pancreas, so this means that you won't have a normal insulin response, um, so glucose can't get into the cell. Uh, and this will cause you to have the increased blood sugar that we see in our diabetic patients, and it'll essentially starve the cells of the body. Um, but what causes the, de the destruction of the beta cells? Well, I read it was an autoimmune response. There's a lot of theories on this. Um, you know, we could go into it, but, you know, that's something that we can look up later. For now, let's just finish the workup. Okay. All right, so our, our patient presented with a lot of the signs of um, type 1 diabetes. Um, thirst, mm -hmm. fatigue, there's polyuria, polydipsia. Um, neuropathy, there's non-healing sores, blurry vision. Did our uh, patient have blurry vision? No, no, no. You're, yeah, you're right. There, there's no blurry vision, and, and that's just because that's usually more of a late onset thing, because the blurry vision is caused by a thickening of blood vessels in the retina, mm -hmm. and that takes a long time to happen, whereas our, our patient presents more acutely. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, what's going on is there's the lack of glucose transport into the cells, so then you have more glucose within your blood. So then that makes your blood more hyperosmotic, and so generally water follows, follows solutes. So you're going to get water coming out of your cells into the blood, so you have lots of glucose and lots of um, water in your blood. And I guess how it works in the kidneys, generally you resorb, um, reabsorb lots of the glucose, but you have so much glucose in your blood, your kidneys can't do all of it, so that's going to kind of pull water um, to follow the glucose back to your blood, um, or not, I'm sorry, not back to the blood, but you're going to get glucose and water, you're going to um, have polyurea, so you're going to be um, using the bathroom a lot, and that's going to also give you a polydipsia, because since you're um, urinating all the time, you're going to be thirsty, mm -hmm. so that kind of explains some of the, the clinical manifestations that we see in the patient. Um, so does someone understand, like, why there's a sore on the toe, like, on the foot of the patient? Yeah, so um, the patient did have a sore on the toe, and I think it's because when you have glucose in the blood for long periods of time, you get advanced glycosylation end products, where you have glucose sticking to a lot of different molecules. Mm -hmm. This then causes damage to vascular walls and, think it's, and thickens them, so then it results in less oxygen and nutrient delivery to tissues. Um, and you kind of see the symptoms more often in the extremities, such as the feet, um, because it's so farther away from the heart. Um, so it prevents healing, and this is a uh, sore can be worsened that way because there's continued damage and there's not nutrients being delivered, and it can even be worsened because there's nerve damage too from diabetes, so you can't even tell that you have a sore there. That makes sense. So, that, so that's that's what these um, advanced glycosylation end products you're talking about are, are probably the ones that are causing a thickening of the retina. Yeah, I think so. That makes sense. Thanks. Thanks. I don't understand that. Sure. Um, all right, so I think we've covered all, uh, explained all of our patient symptoms, but uh, to, to actually diagnose diabetes, you need uh, two random blood sugars over 20 milligrams per deciliter, um, or you need a fasting blood gl glucose over, I think that was 126 milligrams per deciliter. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it's not used as often, but sometimes they use an oral glucose tolerance test. Um, so we can do something called an um, hemoglobin A1C test and it really monitors the diabetic's blood sugar. Um, it calculates it for a period of three months because, you know, red blood cells only last for 120 days, right? Mm -hmm. So the way it does it is that the, the sugar attaches to the hemoglobin molecule and that's how the test is run. So when, uh, when you want to control diabetes, the ultimate goal is to have the uh, hemoglobin A1C value less than 7. Um, 
And in the treatment of type 1 diabetes, there always involves giving insulin. And so there are four types of insulin that we can use. There's fast acting, um, normal, intermediate, and long acting. And these are given via injection several times a day. You said they're given by injection. Why can't you take it orally? Um, so remember that insulin is a peptide hormone. So uh, if it was taken orally, it would be digested in your stomach. So you have to be given through a shot. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And how long do they have to be on insulin? Forever. Oh. We should really move on to comparing type 1 and type 2. Our time's almost up. So just to summarize, the only differences between type 1 and type 2 is just the treatment. Type 1 has to be on insulin. Type 2 doesn't necessarily have to be on insulin. And that's really just because the pathogenesis of the two are different. Whereas type 1 diabetics, their beta cells aren't producing any insulin. Type 2 diabetics, they, their beta cells are producing insulin or they might not be producing enough. But if they're producing it, their bodies are probably just resistant. Right. And the metabolic syndrome is the situation where um, your response to insulin is decreased. Um, and in these patients, you see um, a high blood level of insulin because, you know, you have insulin in your blood, you can't get it into your cells. Um, so there's insulin around, but mm -hmm. you just can't really use it. Mm -hmm. And we should see uh, similar signs and symptoms in, in patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, the diagnosis is the same, uh, but, you, but to differentiate between type 1 and type 2, you have to look at whether insulin is being produced at all. Um, yeah, in type 1 diabetics, there's going to be no insulin made at all, whereas type 2, you're going to just have a little bit. Um, there's also some extra treatments that we can give to patients with type 2 diabetes. Um, there's a variety of oral drugs that act on the body to increase your response to the insulin, um, or even increase the amount of insulin that your pancreas is secreting. Mm -hmm. so, so examples of these are metformin, sulfonylureas, TZD, and bigonides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important to remember that diet and exercise are also really key in the control of diabetes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but we only have five minutes left, so we should probably just use it for checkout. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, you guys, uh, I, I think you've covered a lot of material today and brought up some really important uh, points. Now, since this is a new group, I want you to point out that I noticed that some of you, there is some uneven participation today, and I think that when you check out, uh, I'd like you to comment on your own participation and contribution to the group. Okay, all right. So I try not to be too overbearing with, uh, with being the leader, but it, um, while still participating. Um, and Cece, I wanted to thank you. You really kept us on track during all this. You're welcome. Um, so I think that I personally contributed well today, um, but I would have appreciated spending a little bit more time on the hormonal responses. That's about all. I don't think I participated as much as I could have. Like, I feel like I was really prepared and I did the work, but I, I just didn't feel quite as comfortable, like, jumping in to the material. Yeah, there were definitely <clears throat> a few times when you started to share, Elena, and people were a bit distracted. So this is something that we should all be more aware of and we need to uh, focus on for next time. So what do you think are some um, good strategies to increase participation? Um, something that helps me is that I make sure that I've gone um, a little bit more into depth into one topic that I'm, so I know that I'm more comfortable with it mm -hmm. um, and that I'm going to be prepared to talk about it uh, when I get to the group. And um, also since I'm leading next week, I can make sure to specifically try to include you a little bit more um, to try to help encourage you to talk to. So. Thanks, that'd be great. Well, so this is a, this is a great environment um, uh, for having you learn to speak up and, and tell us what you know or show us what you know. Um, as you enter into the third and fourth year portion of the curriculum, um, you're going to be demonstrating your knowledge on the wards. And it's a good point on trying to determine when to contribute to the discussion, uh, particularly about a patient. And I think this group and this process will allow you to practice that skill so that when you get uh, uh, to the wards, it won't be uh, quite as intimidating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, guys. That's really helpful. Um, that's my turn. Um, so I think our discussion was really great today, and um, Kevin, I think you did a really good job on the board um, because I guess the molecular stuff is kind of what I struggle on, so I'm glad that you really diagrammed it out really well. Oh, thanks. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, I think everyone did a great job today. Elena, I'm really sorry. I, I know you were trying to like talk there, and I totally jumped in. Um, I'll definitely try to be more aware of that. 
And Steph, I really like when you got up on the board. And Elena, it's the same thing as Cece said. I'm sorry about jumping in. I get really excited by IQ, so <laughs> yeah, I just really want to get involved. So, but I'll try and be more aware of it next time. Okay. Yeah, Jeff, I thought you did a really good job leading and moving us along. So right. good job leading. All right, thanks. Okay, group, I think we're finished here. Are you uh, ready to hear the uh, learning objectives? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, uh, number one is to describe the, how the normal body uh, processes carbohydrate, emphasizing the cellular events in the liver, muscle, brain, and red blood cell, uh, sugar, including absorption, metabolism, and storage uh, issues. Um, two, uh, we should, you should be listing and describing the two main hormones involved in carbohydrate homeostasis, including insulin and glucagon, as you've discussed in this case. We get glucagon, but... Well, okay. Um, we need, and we need to include synthesis, release, and mechanism of action. Three, list the common symptoms of diabetes mellitus. Um, four, define uh, diabetes, uh, both types one and types two. Check. Yeah. List the common symptoms of diabetes. Okay. And finally, compare and contrast pathophysiology and genetics of type 1 versus type 2 diabetes. Good job, guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah good job. So uh, I guess the only thing that we didn't really cover was kind of the role of glucagon. We didn't really get into that one very much. Um, um, and I, I think, yeah, that's a really important point. So maybe we should set aside some time uh, in the next session to go over it. Okay. That sound good? That's good, yeah. Okay. Other things, I'd, uh, otherwise I think we'd agree. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Good, job guys. good effort. Cool. Um, hi, I'm Kevin. I'm Elena. And I'm Cece. Um, and we're members of the skit you just watched um, about IQ. And we're going to take this time right now to answer some questions that you guys may have um, about IQ after watching that skit. Um, so check in and check out um, are kind of the ways that we formally begin and end IQ. Check in is usually a bit more informal. Um, it's a time for everybody to say, something fun they did over the weekend, um, something they're excited about in the case. Um, just kind of, It's really open, um, but it's kind of a way to get things rolling, get everybody focused and transitioning into IQ. Um, and then check out is more um, evaluation of yourself, both positive and negative um, contributions to the group, areas for improvement, and then for the group process as a whole, like how did the group do? What did they do good? What did they do bad? Um, what do you think would improve the group function in the future? Um, if the facilitator feels like we're not hitting a learning objective um, that they know is in existence for that case, they'll bring it up on the Monday IQ session to remind us, like, hey, maybe you guys want to look into um, insulin and glucagon specifically as you guys do your research for the case so that it wouldn't have happened on a Wednesday. Right. The facilitator usually has probing questions in their facilitator's guide. After the Monday IQ session, they release suggested resources, which might be um, your textbook, they might be websites, they might be um, primary sources from the literature. Um, and sometimes that can help guide you towards um, things that they find important. Like there might be an article about glucagon, um, then you, you might think, oh, I should probably read about glucagon. Um, so it's kind of a set curriculum as far as the resources go. And then you're always more than welcome to pull from the suggested resources or look online yourself. Beginning of IQ, um, before you start each block, each group develops these norms and how they're going to rotate roles within IQ, like leader. Leader is like the biggest position. Um, some groups do it two leaders per week, one for each case, and some do it one leader per week. Um, and not every team has a scribe or a timekeeper, like CC was saying. You set your norms from the beginning of the block, uh, and that's kind of how you run through the rest of um, the many weeks of IQ that you have from there. Um, these norms aren't set in stone. You can always change it based on the feedback from checkout um, after every case. And the purpose of the scribe would be kind of to make sure that um, you have a record of what you went over. Um, some groups prefer to go back at the end of the week and make kind of standard answers to the required IQ or the required LOs. Um, learning objectives. Learning objectives. And uh, the timekeeper's job is kind of to make sure that we're moving along and keep track of where we are in the case.
Well, in terms of IQ, I mean, I wasn't joking at the end of the skit when I, during my checkout when I was saying that um, I was I'm pretty enthusiastic about IQ. About IQ. Um, I think that educational literature says that you remember five percent of the stuff that you hear um, passively in a lecture, whereas you remember fifty percent of the stuff that you teach. And IQ is all about that: um, getting up, being in a small, safe environment um, with your peers, having fun, and, and teaching one another, learning from one another. One thing I really like about IQ is um, they always say medical school is like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to stay caught up on the material. And the nice thing about IQ is it forces you to keep caught up on the material because twice a week you're responsible to a small group of your peers and everybody will know if you're not prepared. Um, and I think I also say that I forgot. It'll come. Because I always tell this to people I interview. This is like awkward. Oh, um, and the other thing that's really great is like, so you go over the, repetition is also kind of a key to learning, and so you go over the material once when you're preparing for class for IQ, and then you go over the material again in IQ. Um, so when it comes time for the exam, I usually find that, you know, I can take like an hour and review a case and remember like 95% of what we had talked about. And so even though the exams are really spread out because you're mm -hmm. doing the work as you go along, it's really not so bad. So our curriculum is dual, we have both small group and lecture, and during the week we'll have about six hours of required lecture and two cases that typically relate to either the lecture during that week, the week before, or the week after. So we kind of have an idea of what's going on. And the great thing about IQ is that you're there to expand the details about different diseases that you learned about during the block. And sometimes, you know, we might get a lecture on something like hypercalcemia, whereas mm -hmm. in IQ it's set up so we cover hypocalcemia. So sometimes there's overlap and sometimes there's not, but really they try to set you up for success in IQ. In terms of that, it goes back to our first question, check out. Um, is a really good place where you can address um, any nitpicky kind of issues that you may have had about how the group functioned or even maybe something that someone had said during the session. And I think it's also something that's not quite as obvious, but um, it's a good safe place to learn how to approach somebody that you might have um, a difference in your approach to work because throughout the rest of our careers you're going to be learning in a team-based environment on the wards um, and further and so you know you don't necessarily get to choose who is assigned to your team when you're on the wards and it's really important to learn how to work with different personalities um, and different kind of styles um, just in kind of a more safe environment. So. All right, do you guys have anything else to add? No, nope, that's all for me. Case. All right, well, um, we hope you got a lot out of our IQ film. Um, sorry that you couldn't see a session for yourselves, um, but have a great rest of your day. Ha, ha, ha.